Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And this video is talking about blockchain, digital currencies, and of course, regulation, because it all goes hand in hand. Many of you who are following Ripple, the company, and XRP, the digital asset, I think you all shake your heads and say, well, why haven't they adopted the payments technology that RippleNet has? especially when you get a video like this, which is coming from the BIS, the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures. They published a new paper on July 13th, and they're going to present this to the G20 on July 18th. So, okay, okay, here we go again. I think we're just going to committee ourselves to death, meeting after meeting for years on end, and everybody seems to still be off the same page. I'm going to have you listened to this uh, portion of his speech? He's a little long-winded, but I think it's enough um, information to really understand where they're at in their thinking. So this is uh, finally getting to a critical point where they want to improve cross-border payments. Finally, it's a priority. I don't know. You know, really, I'm, I'm skeptical is my middle name. So have a listen to what he has to say, and then we're going to look at some other developments, including a really interesting podcast today from David Schwartz when he brought on the senior general counsel, uh, Mr. Alderati. And anyway, so I, I won't jump ahead. L listen to this portion first. But as anyone who's had to make a payment uh, from one country to another, would have noticed the same is not true at all for cross-border payments. It could take up to 10 days uh, for a payment to get through. It can cost 10 times as much as it would for a domestic payment. And for businesses, 6 out of 10 cross-border payments from one business to another require some form of uh, manual uh, intervention. So, so why have the arrangements for cross-border payments just lagged so far behind uh, developments in other areas of our lives? Well, it's a complex problem. Making a cross-border payment involves a network of banking systems uh, in different countries uh, communicating with each other. Very often, those systems are only open for a limited period of time each day, and those, those periods don't overlap. Payment between two countries can involve five or six different banks. Each one will, will charge a fee, and the payment can break down uh, at each stage. And in some cases, the technology, the messaging, formats that are being used go back a hundred years uh, to the development of the telex machine you just can't carry enough information for the payments to go through it's not just a technical problem different countries have different standards different regulations anti-money laundering checks which are very necessary to ensure that the financial system is not abused often have to be done multiple times in each jurisdiction sometimes that alone can take over two weeks and it does matter cross-border payments globally were worth about $20 trillion uh, last year. Uh, for businesses, just the hassle and cost of uh, the cross-border payment systems discourage many small businesses from trying to access customers in different markets uh, and to grow and take advantage of a global marketplace. And some of the costs actually fall on the shoulders uh, of the poorest migrant workers in, in uh, advanced economies sending money back to home developing countries Remittance flows, flows from workers to developing countries are now worth about three times uh, as much as global development aid. So reducing the cost, increasing the speed uh, would really make a difference. And that's why the G20 group of countries has made improving cross-border payment systems uh, a priority. And why the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, the committee of the major central banks, has today produced a report just setting out how it needs to be done and how we need to tackle all of the angles of this complex problem. And the report sets out a program of 19 building blocks to build uh, a better system. These cover uh, securing a joint commitment to a, to a new improved cross-border payment system uh, from both the public and the private sectors, coordinating better on our regulation uh, and standards, improving our technology, uh, improving harmonization uh, of data, uh, and actually also exploring some of the exciting new technologies like uh, central bank digital currencies, global stable coin, new payment platforms, which while not yet uh, possible, uh, may well give us other ways to improve the system. It's a big task, uh, but if the G20 agrees in it, it's meeting 
uh, later on uh, this week, uh, then I think we have a chance to secure the economic and the social benefits that making changes in this rather forgotten area uh, would bring. So thank you very much for listening. And if you'd like to, to learn more, just please click on the link that's attached to this message. So I think he gets it. This is Sir John Kunliff. He's the chair of the CPMI and he's also the deputy governor uh, for the Bank of England. He, he does get it. And luckily, the UK is really ahead of most of the countries in the world. But there's a lot of countries who are not waiting. I mean, in June, the Bank of Thailand announced its prototype for a CBDC, and it's going to use it for streamlining, streamlining their corporate payments. South Korea announced that it has gone forward with the legal panel for their CBDC. And Japan, just here on the 3rd of July, they announced that they are moving into the test demonstration. So Singapore, while they are probably one of the furthest along, they announced on Monday that they're rolling out their blockchain payments that's ready for commercial rollout. And then today, this is interesting, the uh, Singapore Central Bank, this is uh, an announcement that uh, Temasek Holdings, which is also joined Libra, and JP Morgan, they're in partnership with the Monetary um, Association of Singapore to allow payments of multiple currencies on DLT. Yet there's a lot of countries that are not waiting around. So these long standing frictions have gone long enough, I think. In, it's, in, I know for the people who are holding XRP, it really has gone on long enough. And the focus is now finally to get it fixed. Yeah. So, you know, again, I, I'm always very skeptical on how fast uh, when you get these G20 nations together to actually work on the same page. Um, I think that it is, yes, of course, important and the clarity around the digital assets is imperative, but especially we need to get the U.S. on board. And so I think that if you watch this video and there's any part of it you can take out and push on your side of your world with some local legislators or even going all the way to the top. I think if enough people push, it can make a difference. Now, there is uh, this podcast here that I'm going to play some portions of. This is Mr. Stu Alderati on the right. This is taken from Swell last year, and he's Ripple's general counsel. He speaks to the benefit of countries that have regulated with some clarity, like Singapore, Japan, UAE, the UK. And I think that uh, these countries are taking the lead. Um, and it's, I think, dangerous, and you'll see why in the podcast that I'm gonna play, if these nations leapfrog the United States. It's very, very serious, actually. So uh, let's play a little bit of this where you can see that it's becoming a national economic and security issue, according to uh, Mr. Alderati. And this is a 37 minute discussion. I'm not gonna play that much. I'm only gonna pick out a portion of this that I, that I think is really um, driving home the point. So yeah, I think there's some real danger here. Uh, disadvantages to US companies. Uh, they've already lost the battle with 5G. There's, um, yeah, we've got the 65% of the mining that's being subsidized by the Chinese government for those mining pools that are controlled in China. And that has been with just two digital assets that have had clarity, that's BTC and Ethereum. He talks about that. And of course, when he talks about the carbon footprint, just so you know, um, the Rockdale, Texas is really moving. They're, they're getting a lot of their energy from natural gas, and they're also building out solar farms and wind farms out there. So I think the carbon footprint, I hope, will change for some of these big mining facilities. It looks like Rockdale is going to be part of that change, and I really hope that I'm reporting on some big developments in that area, but we need smart regulation. And if we get this right, 
um, before the technology falls into the wrong hands. That's basically what Mr. Alderati is saying. We, we've got a window of time that's closing. So here, listen to this portion of the podcast. And um, yeah, it's very much to the point. I mean, we've seen just on that point, I, you know, for folks who keep track of this stuff, they'll tell you that blockchain investments in the U.S. have recently declined by as much as 20%. And uh, look, there's a real danger here. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound alarmist, but this is, I think, you know, more rooted in, in fact. There's a real danger here of the U.S. getting the reputation that this technology is not welcome in the U.S. And there's a huge consequence to that. Uh, you're going to disadvantage U.S. companies. And so they can't fairly complete goal globally. So we're not asking for no regulation, we're asking for a level playing field. Uh, and I think, you know, um, look, if you just look to China, what's happened in China with 5G, I think we've lost the 5G race. And there's a real danger here if we lose this race to another country uh, like China, putting aside just the competition issue, right? But there's a real, I think, na national economic or national security issue. So China has already created a new domestic oligopoly for digital payments you know, operated through companies like Alipay and WeChat. Uh, they're also working on their own centralized sovereign digital currency, the digital yuan. And the Chinese government is subsidizing the vast amounts of energy needed to fuel the cryptocurrency miners in China. Uh, at least 65% of the cryptocurrency uh, mining for Bitcoin and Ether is concentrated in China. Uh, that's subsidized by the Chinese government, and that translates into billions of dollars of mining rewards going to these Chinese mining pools. And what's really troubling on this point, David, it's uh, that the two cryptocurrencies, the only two cryptocurrencies that the U.S. regulators have seen fit to declare are not subject to the uh, the very heavy-handed and Byzantine securities laws in the U.S. are the Chinese-controlled Bitcoin and the Chinese-controlled Ether. And, and David, the other thing, and you know, I really haven't gotten into it, and we could do probably you know a whole other you know twenty minutes on it. Is the impact on the environment of these mining pools, these Bitcoin and Ether mining pools? Not only are they uh, subsidized, uh, but the carbon footprint of these mining pools is enormous. I've read statistics that 78 terawatts of energy is used to operate these mining poles. I'm not sure how big a terawatt is, but it seems like really, really big. I've heard it's like the equivalent of the energy consumption of, you know, relatively substantial countries like Finland. And that's just for Bitcoin mining alone. So not only is there uh, sort of the, a, you know, a national economic issue to it. If these mining pools are being subsidized by energy in China, and we've got billion dollars of mining rewards going to Chinese-controlled mining pools. But there's a real, there's an environmental and sustainability aspect to this. I'm not sure if people have really uh, spent that much time or enough time thinking about. So we've got a real, there's a real issue here, right? You, you can lose out on just competition generally if you can't foster innovation around blockchain and crypto in the US, you're just going to move offshore. But then there is sort of a national interest issue where if you lose that race to uh, to China, I think there's real implications for that. But look, you know, look, all is not lost. I'm kind of painting a kind of a pretty dire picture, but all's not lost. We do have regulators in the U.S. that are, uh, I think, leaning into this. And I'll give you two examples. And these are not what I call the markets regulators, like the SEC or the CFTC, but they're very important regulators. So I'll give you two examples. So you know this one, uh, David. Uh, if I use the legacy banking system today and I want to send $1,000 and I'm sitting in the U.S. and I want to send it to you and you're sitting in the Philippines, my bank... Uh, can't tell me, it cannot tell me, uh, before I hit the send on that transaction, whether you're going to receive, uh, $970 and $920 and $930. We only know that after the transaction settles. And the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection, which is the U.S. agency, uh, charged with, uh, protecting consumers, they recently reinforced that, 
the regulation on this, Reg E, which is the regulation that governs electronic transfers of remittances, requires banks. It's the law. Banks have to tell customers in advance precisely what the cost of that transaction will be. And they said legacy systems won't get banks there, but innovative technology like blockchain and crypto, if adopted, could solve this issue for banks. So that's one example. The other recent example is the Office of the Controller of the Currency, which is the OCC, which is the chief banking regulator in the U.S. under acting controller Brian Brooks, who, by the way, was just the recent chief legal officer for Coinbase before he went back to join the OCC. They just issued something called uh, an ANPR, which is an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which is like a request for comment. And they're soliciting comments. And one of the questions they're asking is, hey, What's the barriers to further adoption to crypto-related activities by U.S. bank? And they want people to tell them because they know something's amiss here. We've got this great technology. We don't see it being adopted by banks in the U.S. What's wrong? What's the obstacles? Come in and talk to us about that. And I think what the OCC may hear is that this issue of lack of regulatory clarity in the U.S. is really a huge blocker to banks in the U.S., adopting this technology. There you have it. So I think you're up to date as anybody in what is going on with regulation. And uh, yeah, you have to just keep pushing. And I think we need to push harder than ever to get the right people aware of um, the reality. All right, everybody, I'm going to jump to some fluff. So I received this in my direct mail today on Twitter. And I have to say, it's really fun. It's a, a video where some members of the XRP community are put in as part of the characters. And I have to say, I'm really happy with the character that has been chosen to, to give me this Agent Airy. <laughs> it's great. XRP Undercover, I thank you for that. It was really um, quite enjoyable and fun. And I, of course, want to just send you some crazy, wacky things that are happening here in terms of masks. The, uh, this is one. The fish was funny, right? That was actually this is a this is a bonito tuna. These are the um, these are the small little spring tuna that run that are really, really fast. Uh, it's yummy. And this is <laughs> a ramen mask. Look at. The guy who's modeling it, he decided in the comments on his Twitter to fog up his glasses to really, really illustrate that he has a steaming hot mask of noodles. <laughs> this one is funny. I think it's very, very funny. And then something that's in the um, news also today is that uh, Japan is in its rainy season. We're getting a tremendous amount of of rain more than usual. There's a lot of flooding. And I think the storm that came through in this particular shrine and with the ground being probably very saturated, uh, this old 1200 year old tree fell. And it always is just incredibly sad to see that when it happens. Um, this is some pictures of the tree fallen when you're standing next to it on the road. And this is one from probably a drone. You can see the size and the root ball there. Very sad, but I have um, kind of a good story for this. There is the Hachiman Shrine in Kamakura, which I just love Kamakura. It's the ancient capital. It's about an hour away from Tokyo. It is absolutely a day trip if you come to Tokyo. And if you don't want to rush yourself, then find some place to spend the night. So many things to see and do there. But this was a, a ginkgo tree that was basically the same age. I think it was over a thousand years old. I don't know exactly how old this was. Somewhere between 800 to a thousand years old. And I just loved it. There it was one of the you know highlights for me when i went to the hachiman shrine and then on one day during a storm 
it too fell over it it uh they i think they had since um you know did a clean break but here's the good thing is that this old tree as you can see is really alive and there is new growth coming from it and i know someday 150 to 200 years from now we're going to be able to see a pretty good sized ginkgo tree and in a thousand years it will be just the same size so i'm um, encouraged that uh, there's still life in sometimes those trees that fall hopefully they'll take a, a seedling and plant something from the tree that just fell yesterday and if you go to Kamakura I am going to give you my secret place to eat and you go up this hill here you're in the in the north part of um, it's it's the part where everybody visits so don't worry it's not out of the way and it's in walking distance but you walk up this hill and you get into a house that was built in the Showa era so it's probably a good 70 years old most likely it could be a little older and it's a a restaurant that most foreigners don't know about but it is one of the places that most visitors who are Japanese who go to Kamakura, they always want to go here. It's um, got a great menu, but it's best known for its stew. Now, if you don't like stew, there's other things to order on the menu. I'm going to put a link to it in the description below. It is one of my secret spots when I go to Kamakura, so I hope you get there. All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.